So welcome everyone. So today we've got Anne-Catherine de la Hamet from the University of Vienna. So she's a PhD student in the group of Chaslav Bruckner and has a history of working on quantum reference frames. And so today we've got her talking on identification is pointless, localization of systems and events in superpositions of space times. So when you're ready, um, Anne-Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the um, kind introduction and also for the a uh, nice invitation to present our work here um, today. It's a, yeah, it's a pleasure to share this with you. Um, so as the title says, I'll be talking about localization of systems and events in superpositions of space-times. And this is a relatively recent work and joint work together with um, my collaborators from Vienna. So Victoria Kabel, Luca Apadula, Carlo Cepolaro, and Chaslav Bruckner. And this was a joint collaboration with um, two great philosophers from uh, Oxford and Cambridge, namely Enrique Gomez and Jeremy Butterfield. Now, before um, starting immediately with the plan for today's talk and uh, technical details, I want to start by setting the scene by asking a few questions and inviting you to maybe think about how you would um, possibly answer them. So the first questions are about events and what defines an event. In particular, what defines an event in a non-classical space-time? What does it mean for such an event to be localized? And what can Einstein's whole argument possibly teach us in the context of non-classical space-times? Then I want to talk about causality or causal processes, and in particular, indefinite causal processes. So if you're not familiar with those, those are processes that cannot be assigned a single um, classical or even probabilistic um, classical uh, order of events. So then the question is, to what extent is the indefiniteness of such a causal process a mere coordinate artifact? And what does the indefiniteness tell us about the quantumness of the underlying space-time? Now, these are the questions that I hope that we can address um, throughout this talk and maybe answer at the end of it. Um, but before doing so, I'm going to start by giving you a brief introduction to quantum reference frames. This is going to be brief and also the usual story that we tell about quantum reference frames. So those of you that have already heard um, talks on this topic um, might find this very familiar and you can just relax for two minutes. Um, but then I'm going to try to point at some issues or question marks that came up throughout this research and uh, how we wanted to tackle those. And in particular, we're going to have to look at symmetries and counterparts a bit more closely. And we're going to try to equip ourselves with some tools using these symmetries and counterparts to gain a sort of new understanding of quantum reference frames, first in the setting of quantum theory, and then uh, a bit more generally in general relativity. And then once we have sort of collected all of these tools, uh, we can then tackle some physical applications of our framework. And these are concerned in particular with the space-time localization of events, and then also definite and indefinite causal order. And then I'm going to um, conclude. OK, so let us start with this brief um, from, uh, yeah, introduction to quantum reference frames, and in particular, this research program that has been going on for the last, let's say, 10 years. So there have been works on quantum reference frames before that in the literature, but I'm here really focusing on research efforts from the last decade. And before talking about quantum reference frames, I actually want to start talking about classical reference frames. And here I'm choosing the most simple example that I can come up with. I'm uh, choosing three systems, A, B, and C, which are classical systems, and they can only each be found in one of two uh, configurations, so either up or down. So here I just chose an example of such a configuration for A, B, and C, uh, namely A and B being up and C being down. Now, in this quantum reference frames approach, are really trying to adopt a relational approach to quantum theory. So we're trying to avoid statements in some absolute frame of reference and instead try to give statements of how quantum systems look or what configuration they're in relative to some other system. So here I'm already on the left-hand side, choosing A as the reference system and describing the configuration of B and C. So all I'm doing is saying that relative to A being up, B is up and C is down. Now you see here that uh, A is pointing up in the reference frame of itself. And this is done so by convention in the same sense that if we were to consider 
some astronaut freely floating around in an otherwise empty universe, this astronaut might just by convention um, define the up direction to be the direction aligned from their, toe, their toes up to their head. So this is just convention. And if you don't like it, you can choose a different convention, but I'm gonna follow that one um, right here. And then just by using classical reference frame transformations and consistency uh, between the relative um, correlations between uh, the systems A, B, and C, we see that the configuration relative to C being up, therefore must be A pointing downwards and B pointing downwards. So this is just conserving the systems either being correlated or anti-correlated in direction. So far, so good for classical reference frames. We can now um, um, get this to the quantum realm by placing system C now in a quantum superposition of being in the state up and being in the state down. And we can ask, how do we now change reference frame into that of system C, which is in a non-classical state? And we do so by using the so-called principle of coherent change of reference frame. That is, we try to understand what the reference frame change would look like if C was only in direction pointing upwards. In that case, it's very easy. All systems are pointing upwards on the left, so they're all going to be pointing upwards on the right relative to C. And if C was pointing downwards, then a reference frame change to um, to uh, the reference frame of system C would let us see A and B pointing downwards. So then coherently superposing C to be an up and down gives us the configuration of A and B relative to C being in a superposition of up and down. And in fact, it's not just that A and B are each in a superposition of pointing up and down, but they're being they're in an entangled state in the sense that if A is pointing down, then B is pointing down. If A is pointing up, then B is pointing up. So we already see here that we have here on the left hand side a factorized a separable state and on the right hand side we get an entangled state relative to c and this already concludes the simplest case of a quantum reference frame change and in fact if we bring in some group theory we see that we have done this now for the group z2 in the sense that there are two possible configurations um, classically for the system so they can either point upwards or downwards and there are also two possible uh, transformations on the systems. We can either apply the identity or a flip. Now, this is for finite groups, but we can do the same thing for a continuous variables group, namely, for instance, the translation group. And this might be a, an example that a lot of you are familiar with. Here we again have three systems, but instead of just considering two possible configurations, we let them sit anywhere at any position on the real line. So here on the left hand side, I'm starting in the reference frame of system A, the blue one, which I'm um, illustrating by placing a flag on the position of the blue particle, and I'm assigning labels Xc and Xb to particles C and B. And again, if I perform a normal classical reference frame change and I want to change to, for instance, the reference frame of particle C, the orange one, then in that case, I perform a rigid translation of all my systems by the amount xc, so that on the right-hand side now, my particle c is in the origin. And again, for consistency and keeping the relative distances invariant under this, frame of, uh, under this change of frame, we get that um, particle a will be at minus xc and particle b will be at xb minus xc. So this already concludes the classical case, and we can move on to the quantum one in which we now want to ask, how do we change reference frame into that of particle C if it is in a coherent superposition of two locations? And at the same time, we also let particle B uh, be in some state that corresponds to a spread out wave packet. And again, we can apply this principle of coherent change of reference frame. So trying to understand how we would change reference frame if particle C was only in the left position or if it was only in the right position. And applying the same logic as before, what we find in that case is that again, particle A, the blue one, and wave packet B, the gray one, are gonna be superposed relative to the new orange reference frame. But in particular, they're not just gonna be superposed, but their positions are gonna be correlated with one another. If we rigidly translated all the systems by minus X1C, then we will have done so for all the systems and the same holds for minus uh, XC2. And so we find that the overall state on the left-hand side relative to system C is a superposed entangled state of A and B relative to C. 
So again, we find this feature that we're starting here with a separable state relative to A, and we find a superposed entangled state relative to C. And this is what we would call the relativity of superposition and entanglement in quantum reference frames. And I want to point out here that this is actually not that surprising if you keep in mind that a change of quantum reference frame um, can be seen as a refactorization of the total Hilbert space. And in that sense, the fact that entanglement changes is not really that surprising if you have a different factorization of the Hilbert space on the left-hand side as you do on the right-hand side. Now, this is the second example for the translation group. Um, but I want to point out that um, this has been generalized to actually any uh, symmetry group that is locally compact and actually for any finite number n of systems. So if you hand me some locally uh, compact symmetry group and uh, configurations of all of your systems relative to one of them, I can consistently um, change quantum reference frame to any other of them. Um, but apart from the general um, group theory treatment, which you can find in this reference right here, there are also very specific, interesting um, works on concrete symmetry groups, such as the Galilei group, um, spin rotations, conformal transformations, Lorentz boosts, and even recently asymptotic symmetries. So if you're interested in this, um, you're very welcome to have a look at those. Now, this um, concludes already the, the giving you intuition about quantum reference frame transformations. But I also want to show to you briefly how this framework can be used um, as an or in applications to uh, questions of gravity, and in particular, gravity sourced by objects in superposition. So in a sort of recent paper, um, we asked the question of how a probe particle would dynamically evolve in the vicinity of a macroscopic mass in superposition, in spatial superposition. And we did not, in particular, want to assume any approach to quantum gravity or make any assumptions about the gravitational field sourced by this mass in superposition. And instead, the strategy that we adopted here uh, uses the help of quantum reference frames. So what we do in this strategy is we change into the quantum reference frame in which the gravitational source is definite. So in that case here, that is the quantum reference frame assigned or associated to the massive object. And as a second step, we then solve the problem in the new reference frame. So this means that we first change into the frame of the massive object. This is perfectly analogous to the example of the three particles we just had. And we will find that um, while the pro particle was localized in the reference frame before, now it's going to be the pro particle that is in a spatial superposition of left and right, and the massive object will be um, um, localized in position, in particular, in the origin of the reference frame. Now we can solve the problem in this frame, and we will see that the pro particle will evolve in a superposition of geodesics falling towards the massive object. Um, this is not just um, some theoretical calculation. This has actually been probed in experiments, so we do have empirical data supporting um, this sort of dynamics. Then as a third step of our strategy, we can simply transform back into the original quantum reference frame and now infer the dynamics of the pro particle in this frame. And we will find that it falls in a superposition of geodesics towards the respective location uh, of the massive object in superposition, so towards the left and towards the right. And in the process of that, it will get entangled with the position of the mass. Now, of course, um, this inference of the dynamics in the original quantum reference frame assumes that the physics stays invariant under changes of these frames. So this is the assumption that we're putting in here. This is the assumption that replaces any further assumptions on the gravitational field, but still we should be aware that this is something, this invariance has not been tested experimentally. Now, while we did stay sort of agnostic about the quantum nature of the gravitational field in this approach and instead only used assumptions based on invariance of physics under changes of frame, um, the predictions that we get here are fully in line with, for instance, linearized quantum gravity, or put differently, um, understanding the massive object as some sort of quantum perturbation around some classical fixed space time. Um, so I'm drawing here this superposition of space times, but if the mass is very small, we can just understand this as perturbations around a fixed classical background. However, if, if the massive object becomes 
more and more massive, or we're allowing for more and more massive objects to be placed in superposition, then there will be the point at which there won't exist one single classical background around which these masses are simply causing perturbations of space-time, but they are going to be the main source of, of they're going to be sourcing space-time itself. And in that case, it's unclear what it then even means to say that the mass is in a superposition of locations. Of course, we can naively say, well, let me just um, place some coordinate system here and say that the mass is in a superposition of being at positions one, two on the left-hand side and at position three, two on the right-hand side. So clearly it's in a superposition of different locations. But we all know from the diffeomorphism invariance of GR that space-time point labels themselves have no have no direct physical meaning. And in, in fact, there is nothing that prevents me from simply reshuffling coordinates on these space times. And now saying that the massive object is actually in position three, one in both space times. So is the massive object now in the same location or is it still in a superposition of different locations? And here I want to argue that it depends. It depends on the choice of reference frame and in particular on the choice of quantum reference frame. Now, before going on and showing you exactly how this works, I want to have this sort of disclaimer slide right here, in which um, I want to point out that when we talk about non-classical spacetimes here, or superpositions of such non-classical spacetimes, we really mean a superposition of states peaked around semi-classical metrics. So this is a particular regime of a potential theory of quantum gravity that is in a way complementary to approaches to a full theory of quantum gravity. Um, still, we view these superpositions of semi-classical spacetimes as a playground to investigate important conceptual questions, such as what does it mean for the massive object to be in a superposition of locations, but also the other questions that I showed to you at the beginning of this talk. Okay, so we can then try to take a closer look now at symmetries and counterparts and try to see if there is something useful that we can um, that we can use in the following to make sense of quantum reference frames in quantum theory and general relativity. And I want to start very general. And what you will see now in the next few slides might seem familiar to those working in gravitational physics or gauge theories. But if not, then I'm just going to give you a brief overlook here. We're going to start by considering a very general theory that is uh, equipped with some symmetry group G. And on the right hand side here, this big phi, this big rectangle, is the space of all possible configurations or all possible models. Um, and because of the existence of the symmetry group G, there is a lot of redundancy in this space of models. And in fact, it can be partitioned into orbits of the symmetry group G such that any two models that live on the same orbit, such as phi and phi g here, are always connected or can be transformed into one another by a symmetry transformation. So there is a symmetry group element g that relates the two models living on the same orbit. So in that sense, they are taken to represent the same physical state of the world. Two models living on different orbits, such as phi and phi dash here, are however physically distinct. They're physically inequivalent models or configurations. Now, given this redundancy in the space of models, it is very useful to pick representatives of, on each orbit. And if we do so, and if we do so in a sufficiently smooth way, then we choose a section. A section here, sigma, is this red line right here, which ends up picking one representative on each orbit in the space of models. And this choice of section can really be seen as a mere matter of convention. I am entirely free to choose whatever representative I want on each orbit. And this choice of section can then be seen as a choice of reference frame or even quantum reference frame, as I'm going to be arguing later. Now, to immediately give you an example, um, we're going to take again this uh, translationally invariant theory. So a theory in which I allow for rigid translations of my systems. And I'm here only considering two systems. I have this uh, cartoon Earth and I have the atom here, the probe particle. And I'm considering two models which are physically distinct because the relative distance between the atom and Earth is different in both, um, in both models phi and phi dash. 
And here I have chosen a section which places the probe particle in the origin in both models. So in a way, already we can view this section as corresponding to the frame or the perspective of the probe particle. Just to jump now, in to this question. Um, yes. Can I think of this section as like the gauge fixing surface of the perspective neutral? Approach. Exactly. Yes. So a choice of section in and in particular a choice of a representative on each orbit can precisely be seen as gauge fixing. Um, and it is also this freedom of gauge fixing differently across different orbits that will then relate it to um, quantum reference frames, um, both in the um, in the approach by uh, Bruckner, Giacomini, Castro, and also the perspective neutral framework, at least for perfect quantum reference frames. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, so you see here that we have um, these two models. Um, and as I just said, we can choose very different gauge conventions for them. So then this begs the question of how we can even compare different statements in these different models or different possible worlds. Now, I'm not sure if um, if people in the audience are very familiar with um, possible worlds in the, in the philosophy of physics, but there is actually a very important um, philosopher called David Lewis, um, who is the father of counterpart theory. Um, in fact, uh, David Lewis was um, in particularly concerned uh, about uh, or trying to understand counterfactuals, so if-then statements. Um, as an example, um, if our collaborator and co-author Jeremy Butterfield had not visited us in Vienna, he would have instead gone to the Maldives. Now, the Jeremy Butterfield that ended up visiting us in Vienna must have had a very different experience from the Jeremy Butterfield that did go on vacation on the Maldives. And still, we would like to say that the Jeremy Butterfield in the one possible world is sort of the same Jeremy Butterfield as in the other possible world. In this jargon of counterpart theory, we would say the two Jeremy Butterfields are counterparts of each other. Generally, objects are called counterparts if they are similar to one another in relevant aspects. But which aspects is up to us? It depends on the context. Now, in the context of the statement that I just gave to you, it is clear to all of us that the one Jeremy Butterfield is similar to the other one in relevant aspects, such as they've had the same history up until the point at which they decided to go to Vienna or go to the Maldives. They share the same um, genetic code, the same DNA, the same upbringing, and so on. But of course, this is convention. We have chosen the context in which we state that one germ butterfield is the counterpart of the other. And coming back to our space of models, it is the same for two models that look different, and we want to say whether they are actually the same or different. So. Put in other words, if I hand to you two models and they look different to you because there are certain differences between them, then there are two reasons for which these two models can look different. The first one being that they are actually physically distinct. They're just, they're just models living on different orbits, or I have just chosen different gauge conventions to them. And in order to disentangle these two sources of differences for the two models, what is usually done in particular in gauge theories and gravitational physics is to go to the gauge invariant representation. So to strip these models bare of any gauge conventions and then compare the gauge invariant representations. And then we can without a doubt say whether the two models are the same or different. But here in this relational approach and this approach of quantum reference frames, we do want to stay in the gauge variant pictures because there's a lot of advantages to keeping these gauge variant degrees of freedoms. So instead, we want to use a different tool that tells us whether two configurations are truly the same or truly different. And this tool is called the counterpart relation. And this is something that was already established in works by Gomez and Butterfield um, previously. And mathematically, it's actually extremely simple. We can compute the counterpart relation for any two models, phi and phi dash, in the space of models, relative to some choice of section sigma. And what we do is we extract first the group, the symmetry group element that would transform our model phi down onto the section. And then we compose it with the inverse of the group element that would take phi dash down onto the section. So really, the counterpart relation is just the composition of two symmetry group elements. And what it tells us is the amount of difference between the two models that is only due to gauge conventions, and that can be entirely removed by applying the correct symmetry transformations. 
But importantly, it is not removing these gauge conventions, and we still have these handles to move around these models in a in a nice way, as is done a lot in quantum reference frames. Okay, so now that we've seen um, sections and counterpart relations, we are now fully equipped to really talk about quantum reference frames first in quantum theory. So here the idea is that a choice of quantum reference frame really corresponds to a choice of section in the sense that a quantum reference frame tells us what the same or different elements are relative to it. So as an example here in the frame of the probe particle, it is the position of the probe that is identified across both branches of the superposition. And we're saying that the position of the mass in the one branch on the right is different from the position of the mass in the other branch on the left. Similarly, if we went into the frame of the massive object, here we would identify the position of the massive object, and it would be the position of the probe that is different in the one branch than it is in the other branch. And this then also makes sense of these relative quantum states, which we tend to write in these different quantum reference frames. So we can make sense of this visually, again, in our space of models. But we are taking one big step. We're making one big extension here, also with regards to previous literature, which is now to no longer consider the models phi and phi dash as possible models, possible worlds, but really as actual worlds, actual models in a superposition. So any orbits that I'm drawing here, they contain a model and they're really considered as two models in superposition. So to start here, we have this um, section sigma, which is drawn here. And as I already explained before, this corresponds to choosing the origin um, to sit at the position of the pro particle in both models. So if we're now superposing both those models, this yields us this overall configuration here. So really we're describing the pro particle sitting in the middle in the origin in a definite position and the massive object being in a superposition of left and right. And this corresponds then to this quantum state right here, where it's again the position of the pro particle factorizing out. Uh, one can check that for any two models that already sit on the section that we have chosen, we always get the identity as the counterpart relation. And what this is supposed to tell us is that if we're comparing matters in the one branch with matters in the other branch, we can simply directly compare them. If they look different, they are different. If they look the same, they are the same. Now we can change quantum reference frame to the other object that we have here. So the massive object, the Earth. And we do so in two separate steps. The first step of the quantum reference frame change in this space of models um, consists of applying branch dependent, model dependent symmetry group transformations. So on the orbit right here, where we have the model phi dash, we have to shift everything by the amount minus a towards the left in order for the mass to sit in the origin after the transformation. On the other branch, in the other model, we have to apply a rigid translation by plus a for the mass to end up sitting in the origin. So this is the first step, symmetry transformations that are different in different branches in different models. But the second step now consists of choosing the section that corresponds to the reference frame of the massive object. So this is the section sigma tilde here, which is the one that crosses through the transformed models. And I can check whether I have performed the right two steps by computing the counterpart relation relative to the new section of the transformed models. And if that again gives me the identity, then I know that I am now truly in the reference frame of the massive object in the sense that I can directly compare where is the particle in the one branch versus where is it in the other branch. And if it's different, then it's truly in a superposition of different locations. And this corresponds to the overall quantum configuration as in the massive object sitting in the origin and us having a coherent superposition of the particle sitting at A and minus A. So we see that this is a different way of understanding that how we identify position across the branches changes with the quantum reference frame. So in this sense, it becomes very natural to see that superposition must depend on the reference frame because how we identify or differentiate certain statements, well, it just changes with the choice of quantum reference frame. OK, so this concludes already quantum reference frames in quantum theory. So we saw that we used this example of a um, theory that is um, invariant under rigid translations. But 
in a way, we could have still said that there is some sort of implicit background against which we can make certain statements. In GR, that will no longer be the case. Now, if we take quantum reference frames now for general relativity, and we have to start from scratch. So what is a model first? A model here in our space of models is a tuple that consists of a manifold, a metric, and in general, just a set of matter fields. The space of models that I draw here, I want to point out that that is the set of kinematically possible models. So I'm not imposing any constraints or any dynamics here at this point. Um, and the symmetry group, which is relevant in this case, is the group of diffeomorphisms acting on this manifold M. So any two models living on the same orbit, like here, phi1 and phi1d, are related by a specific diffeomorphism. And here I chose the diffeomorphisms to act um, on the metric and the matter fields, but I could have just also let them um, instead act just on uh, points on the manifold. And again, instead of just considering two possible models in my space of models, I again want to consider them as actual models in quantum superposition. So here I have a quantum superposition of model phi1 and model phi2. And I want to briefly explain what I mean by these symbols right here. You see that I have indexed the manifold in the first branch of the superposition differently as the one in the second. But I want to point out that M1 and M2 as differentiable manifolds are diffeomorphic. They're merely copies of one another, and I chose to label them differently to later on avoid any confusion about which diffeomorphism is acting on which manifold. But if you don't struggle with the confusion in that matter, you can just think of it as one manifold on which you can have superpositions of field configurations. And speaking of field configurations, I have here in the metric field in a superposition of two different or possibly two different configurations, G1 and G2. So we think of the metric being quantum in the sense that it can be found in a quantum superposition of different configurations. And the same goes for the matter fields. They can also be found in a superposition of different configurations. So again, these fields are quantum in the sense that they're in quantum superposition, but the configurations in each branch are still um, considered semi-classical. Now, because we are still in this relational approach um, to GR and we want to make sense of quantum reference frames in general relativity, we want to ideally express all of our statements, all of our quantities um, relative to some reference systems. And as reference systems here, it is no longer sufficient to choose something like the atom, the probe particle, or this one massive object, because this is simply not going to have enough structure to encode all of the degrees of freedom. So instead, what we need are four scalar fields, four because of the dimension of space-time that we're assuming here. Um, and these scalar fields, I'm going to be calling them chi a, a going from zero to three. And when I say add a set of scalar fields, this doesn't really sound very nice because it sounds like I'm adding something on top to make it relational. And this is not really in the spirit of, of operational quantum reference frames. So instead, you can also think of this as finding within your matter fields a set of four scalar fields. And usually, if the situation that you're considering is complex enough, you will be able to find some combinations of um, scalars of tensor fields that will satisfy all of the necessary conditions. And if not, then you will have to add them on top. In fact, uh, when talking about how to model these um, four scalar reference fields, um, we can distinguish three options. And I'm using here a relatively recent categorization by Bamonti, which is based on a previous one by Ravelli. Um, and the three options for modeling these chi fields are the following. The first one is the simplest one. It is treating the chi fields as entirely idealized. So as mere abstract coordinate fields that are not necessarily tied to any physical system. So they're really like choosing coordinates in your classical mechanics course and saying cylindrical coordinates are very useful to treat the situation. Let me choose those. So you're entirely free to identify any suitable coordinate system. But of course, it's not as physically meaningful because you don't have an actual physical system that these coordinate fields are associated to. So if you're not um, satisfied with this abstract way of modeling the chi fields, then you can go to option two. Option two um, consists of modeling the chi fields as dynamical fields 
but neglecting any back reaction of the chi fields. So as an example, these could be um, Klein-Gordon fields on curved space time. So we don't have back reaction, but the Klein-Gordon fields do feel the metric tensor. They do feel the curvature of space time. So in this sense, uh, this is a more realistic, more physically meaningful way of modeling um, uh, the, the reference fields, the scalar fields. Um, but there is a third option, which is even more realistic, which is to also take into account the back reaction of the chi fields. In a way, this is the most realistic way of modeling them. But in full generality, this would involve um, solving the full Einstein equations. And we believe also this would restrict the freedom in choosing um, these reference fields uh, quite drastically because you're restricted to just solutions of your dynamical equations. Now, importantly, you are free to choose either of these options in the following. And having talked to different people over the last weeks and months, we have realized that different people in the field have very different applications in mind using these quantum reference fields in GR. And so some people do prefer these idealized quantum coordinate fields that abstractly sit on top of the configurations that they're modeling. And others really require that there is some coupling between the chi fields and the metric tensor, possibly even some back reaction and so on. So depending on how you want to view quantum reference fields, whether they are physical rods and clocks in your configurations or whether they're just abstract, that is really up to you. And in the following, you can choose either of these options. Now here I'm adding immediately two such sets of um, uh, scalar fields. So we have on the one hand four um, scalar fields chi um, zero to three, but we also have the blue set um, of chi tilde fields. So these are already two separate sets of um, scalar fields. These are gonna be our two quantum reference frames later on between which we want to change back and forth. So then this uh, begs the question, what does it mean to now go into the reference frame of let's say the chi fields? Previously, we identified the points at which the quantum reference frame, so either the earth or the particle were located. We could see that as threading or identifying these points, but it was just one single point because we were considering them as point particles. So now we will have to do the same, but applying this to our scalar fields. So we're gonna use the values of the scalar fields chi to both label the points on the manifolds and identify them. So thread them together across the branches in superposition. So concretely, we say that we identify a point P on the first manifold, M1, with a point Q on the second manifold if chi1 returns the same value for P in this space of values as chi2 does for Q. So we say that P and Q are counterparts of one another if and only if the chi fields in their respective branches assign to them the same coordinate value. This allows us to define the so-called comparison map, which is really just the counterpart relation, but in the case of general relativity. So the comparison map relative to a choice of chi fields is just given by the composition of chi one and chi two inverse, and can be seen as a map from the first manifold to the second manifold, assigning to each point P its counterpart Q on the second manifold. Now, if you're familiar with the idea of Einstein's point coincidences, then this seems extremely intuitive to you. But if you have not heard of these point coincidences before, I just want to briefly introduce a very simple toy example, which has nothing to do with general relativity, which is only there to build some intuition for why this is a, a natural strategy of identifying points. So here, forgetting for a moment about general relativity, I want to take two models in a three-dimensional space of models in superposition. And I'm considering my chi fields to be color fields. So here I have three chi fields, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. And if I mix them accordingly to certain weights, then these will give me a certain color configuration on the, on the manifolds. And the chi fields are in particular in a quantum superposition of configurations meaning that I have a different color configuration on the first manifold as I do on the second manifold. Now, what I did in my uh, software of Keynote is I actually went to the RGB slider and I read out the color, so the weights of red and green and blue at a particular point P that I chose. And I found these values right here. 
And then what I did was I looked for the point that had the same color values on the second manifold. And this was this point Q right here. So in this sense, chi one, the configuration in the first branch, assigns to P the same values, the same coordinates as chi two in the second branch assigns to Q. And in this sense, P and Q are identified relative to these chi fields because the actual physical content at these points is the same relative to the chi fields. And if we view these configurations as just configurations in superposition of the same physical field, then we find that this is a very natural, a very operational strategy to identify points across manifolds. Is it, is, it, is it restricted to um, diffeomorphic manifolds, this comparison map, or can you in principle use it for non-diffeomorphic? Oh, that's a good question. Um, actually, let me come to my next slide, which is on a caveat, and then we I will try to address this question of whether M1 and M2 need to be diffeomorphic, because this is precisely on whether the comparison map is well defined. So I did not mention that before, but um, now having seen this color example, we can actually make a lot of sense of this. In fact, there are some um, conditions for the comparison map to be well defined. So of course, the four scalar fields must define a bijective map from the manifold to the space of values, in this case R4, if space-time is four-dimensional. And if they are bijective, then this is well-defined, and then we can fix the field values and remove any redundancy induced by the diffeomorphism invariance. But if this is not the case, so in particular, it could be that the fields are um, um, are not inhomogeneous enough. So in the, in the sense that um, in, in the example of the color fields, if there are regions in which the fields look too much um, the same so that we cannot distinguish um, or we cannot uniquely identify points on the one manifold with points on the other one, um, uh, then, then this comparison map is not well defined. And so what we do generally is that either we assume that we can find fields in this very complex actual physical situation such that there is always enough inhomogeneity um, to find fields that can uniquely um, distinguish and identify points across the manifold uh, or across the superposition, or we restrict to sufficiently small regions of the manifold so that at least on these regions, um, the chi fields are sufficiently inhomogeneous. Now, to come back to the question that was just asked, um, do they have to be diffeomorphic? Um, so first, I think we come from the premise that they are already the same manifold. So I, I have, um, in the sense, the manifold without the metric, as in I have one manifold, and then on top of that, I can have the space-time metric in some quantum state, and I can have my matter fields in some quantum state. So coming from that perspective, um, it's not really clear why you would consider more than just one manifold and its copies. Um, but if it's a question more, more like technically and mathematically, then I think if you um, choose these manifolds in a way that the comparison map is still well defined, then this would be fine. Does this address your question? I think so. So then um, it would work for all diffu like just in terms of mathematical consistency, it would work for all diffeomorphic manifolds. But there are more ma there are in principle non diffeomorphic manifolds that it could work for. But yeah, in principle, yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so then this concludes the part on quantum reference frames in general relativity. So we have now constructed these um, quantum coordinate fields, these scalar fields that allow us to operationally identify points across the superposition um, and really instantiate quantum reference fields. And now we can tackle the first of the two physical implications that I want to talk about. The first one being on localization of events in space time. And in particular, we want to ask, what does it mean for an event to be space-time localized? And how does the localization of an event in space-time depend on the quantum coordinate system? So here I have drawn, again, this superposition of spatial superposition of a mass to have a superposition of space-times. And I've drawn two world lines, the orange and the black one, crashing in one point. So this could be two satellites orbiting the gravitational source and crashing. Uh, and we can ask whether this crash happens in a space-time localized manner. So if we sat on this Earth, would we see this crash happening in one point in space and time? What would happen if we sat somewhere else? And how do we even define localization? In particular, we have seen that depending on our choice of reference fields, so there could be some chi fields, this can either be 
uh, these or these points can either be identified with one another because we have chosen fields that assign the same coordinate value to this point, or we could have chosen some other set of uh, reference fields, chi tilde, which would just assign different coordinate field, uh, coordinate values to these points, and therefore the crash would be happening in a space-time delocalized manner. To make this all a bit more precise, let me define what I mean by localized. So if I take a pair of points, P and Q, P living on M1 and Q on M2, then I say that this pair of points is localized if and only if they are counterparts of one another. So if and only if relative to the comparison map of the chi fields, they are, um, they are identified, so they're mapped onto one another. Now, I can change quantum reference frame from these chi fields, the red um, reference fields, to the blue reference fields, the chi tilde ones, by again applying these two steps that we saw before in the space of models. So you remember that the first step consisted of these um, branch or model dependent symmetry transformations. So that in this case will be diffeomorphisms. And this will in general be a different diffeomorphism on the first model than on the second model. So on the first model, I'm choosing D1 to map it to the section of the chi tilde fields. Um, and this will in general map my point P to some image D1 of P. And in the second model, I'm applying some other diffeomorphism D2, which will map Q to its image D2 of Q. Now, in general, there is absolutely no reason why the new comparison map, so changing now the section to the new counterpart relation, the new comparison map, would map the same um, or would map D1 of P to the same coordinate value point in the space of values as um, D2 of Q. And in particular, the counterpart of D1 of P will be some general point, which is the image under the comparison map of D1 of P. Now, if you don't immediately believe that this is true, and uh, there's in principle no reason why you should, then I'm going to give you a concrete example of uh, chi and chi tilde fields for which this is true. So here I'm using uh, combinations of scalar functions of both the Riemann and the Weil tensor. So I have this red collection of fields, the chi fields, which consists of these four combinations. And I have the blue fields, reference fields, the chi tilde ones, which consist of these four combinations. And I have here, just for the sake of a toy example, chosen a point P to which these five quantities take the values one, zero, two, three, four. So this means that um, chi1 will map p to the point 1, 2, 3, 4. You can just plug these into the four combinations right here, and you get 1, 2, 3, 4. And if you do the same for the point q on the second manifold um, with these values of the five quantities right here, and you again plug them in into the red fields, you will also get 1, 2, 3, 4. And in that sense, these four combinations of fields um, identify P and Q. However, if you plug in those values into the blue fields, you will again get one, two, three, four for P, but you will get, I believe, two, two, three, four, if I remember correctly, for the point Q. And in that sense, they're not assigned the same coordinate value, and there will be in general some other point Q tilde, which is the image under the comparison map of the chi tilde fields of P. So this is just to show you that there exist fields, and in particular, these fields are in relative superposition uh, to one another, uh, for which the identification of points is not preserved. And coming back to events um, and space-time localization of events, we see that both the identification of space-time points and the localization of events are dependent on the quantum frame. And so in general, there is no absolute physical meaning that we can give to some event being space-time localized or not. And we view this as a quantum extension of Einstein's classical whole argument in the sense that Einstein's classical whole argument can be read as um, arguing against the physical significance of manifold points, space-time points, and that we should, should rather use coincidences of physical fields on some classical manifold in order to get rid of any mentioning of the space-time points and make physical sense um, of coincidences and thus not run into issues of the whole argument. And here, what we see is that we cannot give physical significance to identification of space-time points across a superposition. Um, and instead, we should use point coincidences 
um, of um, physical fields to talk about um, to talk about events or uh, systems. Okay, so this concludes this first point on localization of events. And as a second point, we will um, go over indefinite causal order. And um, to keep the time in mind, I will actually um, try to not go too slowly over this part. So um, what I want to look at here in this section is one example of a process that cannot be assigned a classical causal order, um, and that is the quantum switch. The quantum switch is just abstractly a process uh, which implements two operations, U1 and U2, on a target system in a quantum controlled superposition of orders which means um, that here on this state of the target system, we have a quantum controlled superposition of U1, U2 and U2, U1. Um, and this is a process which um, is a causally non-separable process, which means there is not even a probabilistic um, explanation in terms of classical causal orders that would make sense of this process. Now this quantum switch has been implemented experimentally and any such um, experimental implementation on some optical table is called the optical quantum switch. Here, two experimenters, Alice and Bob, each receive this physical system, the target system, and upon receiving it, they perform their operation U1 or U2 on it, and then they send it out of their laboratory. Now, if we prepare the target system, which in the optical quantum switch is actually just a photon, if we prepare it to move in a superposition of paths, which we can do using a beam splitter, then the operations of Alice and Bob are performed in a superposition of orders. So first Alice and then Bob in a superposition with first Bob and then Alice. So in the case of the optical quantum switch, the indefinite causal order is implemented through a superposition of paths of trajectories. Now, shortly after the following issue was proposed by some or was raised by some people in the community, is this a proper realization of indefinite causal order? Since there is still a fixed Minkowski background, it's unclear whether the causal structure, which is believed to be intimately tied to the space-time structure, is really in a superposition. Or is this maybe just a simulation of indefinite causal order, but since it has nothing to do with quantum um, phenomena in the space-time, it's, it's not really um, a realization. So there is this ongoing debate uh, between realization and simulation. And one can roughly divide this debate into two camps. There are the spatial temporalists who would say, well, if I draw this quantum switch in a space-time diagram, there are clearly four points in space-time at which these agents are applying their operations. So it's not really true that Alice is only applying her operation once and Bob is only applying his operation once, but they do so in superposition of orders, it's really just that there are four events evolved, involved in this process. And then the other camp, the so-called dynamicists, would say, well, no, there are two events evolved in this process. It's just that each of them is happening in a superposition of two space-time locations. Then, um, not just as a response to the to this debate, but it can also be seen as some sort of response to this debate, we can look at the gravitational quantum switch in which, again, two experimenters, Alice and Bob, perform an operation UI on some target system when it enters their lab. But here we have the difference that we really have space-time involved in navigating and directing the order in which events happen. In fact, we have a gravitational field sourced by a massive object in a superposition of locations, which leads to gravitational time dilation that is different in the different branches of the superposition. So if we restrict Alice and Bob to performing their operation at a particular fixed proper time tau star, so when their clock in their laboratory shows the particular time tau star, then in the branch in which the massive object is on, is on the right, time will, or the Bob's clock, will tick more slowly than Alice's clock since he's closer to the massive object. So he experiences stronger time dilation, and Alice will first apply her operation A, and then Bob will apply his. In the other branch, it's the other way around. Alice experiences stronger time dilation, and therefore Bob's event happens before Alice. And if we now send the target system through this setup, we will have indefinite causal order implemented now, not because of just some superposition of trajectories, but really because we have a superposition of gravitational fields. 
So given the superposition of gravitational fields and thus of causal structures, we can ask, would this now be a proper implementation of indefinite causal order? And one can roughly sketch the debate as the spatial temporalists saying, yes, now we only have two events. We can make sure that Alice only receives the system ones and Bob as well. But then you have the dynamicists saying, but again, if you draw this in a space-time diagram, now relative to a faraway observer, it's the same situation as before. You again have four points in space-time. So how is this any different to the optical quantum switch? So you see that there is this ongoing debate regarding this implementation. And at the core of this debate seems to be at least one of the questions seems to be how many events there are implemented in this process, where we have the spatial temporalists saying there are four events because for them, an event is a point in space time. And we have the dynamicists saying there are two events because for them, an event is an application of an operation, at least in this context. Uh, and to summarize this, uh, and quoting Ognyan Oreshkov from a few years back, uh, saying that the interpretation of such experiments as realizations of a process with indefinite causal structure has at least remained controversial. So we were considering this debate, and we had also worked a bit on these indefinite um, uh, causal processes, and then we thought, well, maybe quantum reference frames, and in particular here, quantum controlled diffeomorphisms, maybe they can bring some insight into this debate. And so we simply applied this framework of, of, of uh, uh, applying quantum diffeomorphisms on such a setup to see if we can say something about the number of events um, in the quantum switch. And so on the left-hand left hand side here, you can see the, um, the optical switch. So you can just under try to understand the metric in the upper and the lower model as just being Minkowski. And we have in total four different space-time points because we chose here, for instance, the chi fields of the laboratory. And relative to the laboratory, um, Alice's event is happening in a superposition of times uh, EA1 and EA2, and so for Bob. So this is the four-point switch, which could correspond to the Minkowski switch, for instance. And we showed that by applying quantum control diffeomorphisms, so D1 on the first manifold and D2 on the other, we can always map this to a two-point switch. So a quantum switch to which we can only assign two space-time points. This would in general be some other set of chi tilde fields, other reference fields, but we can assign the same coordinate value to the event of Bob and to the event of Alice. So the claim here is that we can map any four-point switch into a two-point switch. And so in that sense, if we can change the number of space-time points, and we can change the space-time location of an event, then this should not be seen as a relevant property in discussing whether the process implemented is a realization or a simulation. And what else we discussed in, in this paper, and you can look at uh, this reference right here if you're interested, is that we can actually formulate um, the indefinite causal order implemented in the quantum switch in an invariant manner, in a coordinate invariant way, and we can show that the type of indefinite causal order implemented by both the optical and the gravitational quantum switch are actually of the same type. So they exib exhibit the same type of indefinite causal order. Uh, there are, of course, other observables, such as space-time curvature, which one could still measure and observe and tell apart the two experiments. But in terms of the indefinite causal order experienced in a way by the target system, uh, we can really cast it in the same quantity, and therefore we would say it's of the same type. So this is just to show um, how we can apply this framework of quantum reference frames to discussions in the field of indefinite causal structures. And if you're interested, we also wrote a recent, uh, very easily readable essay on this matter right here. And then this brings me already to um, my conclusion. Um, we have seen uh, today how to make sense of quantum reference frames in terms of symmetries, counterparts, and identification. Uh, in this framework, quantum reference frames are choices of sections in a space of models. Um, quantum reference frames in quantum theory define what is the same and what is different relative to them. We have then applied this framework to superpositions of semi-classical space times and constructed quantum coordinate fields and a comparison map that identifies points across manifolds using coincidences of physical field values. And I have two take-home messages for you. The first one being that 
localization of events is frame dependent and has no absolute physical meaning. And this uh, hopefully explains the pun in, our, uh, in the title of our paper that identification is pointless. And the second one being that the number of space-time events can vary under changes of quantum frame, but the causal order between events remains invariant. And with this, um, I thank you very much for attending and for your attention, and I look forward to any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you very much. All right, Let's see if we have any questions from the audience. I, I would like to ask a question, if that's OK. Um, thanks so much for your talk. That was um, a really amazing, amazingly clear way to bring a bit of clarity to that debate about simulation and realization. I really like that. I think that was a, I mean, okay. there, there was so much that went into it, but then in the end, you know, it just was a very neat response to that particular debate. But then I want to, I want to ask you more about that. So mm -hmm. um, just thinking about the analogy to Einstein's point coincidence argument. Now, I may not have exactly Einstein's interpret. I may not get Einstein's interpretation e exactly here, but my understanding was that in the point coincidence arguments, um, the there's no physical significance to any particular. Um, mapping between coordinate systems it's mm -hmm. really just uh it's, so this is apart from actual um you know point coincidences it's really just um a way that we can express the laws in a manageable way or a tractable way and it's really when we get these point coincidences that's kind of that's the thing that's got these physical significances so but now translate that over into this um indefinite causal order case mm -hmm. i mean is it is the conclusion here that the debate between what's realization and what simulation a non-debate or is it that it's just about what we take to be um a tractable way to describe the system right so um maybe i rushed over this too fast as well when i came to the question okay, yeah, right. you meant before um, so really what I wanted to say is that our our quantum version of the whole argument is saying that again, um, now in the in the context of superpositions of space times, we're also taking these um, coincidences of fields to make sense of our um, identification of points. But again, we find a redundancy, namely, if I choose the chi fields, then any two points P and Q are identified with one another, but if I choose any other chi tilde fields, then they're not. So there's still a, oh, yeah, okay. a freedom of choosing which collection of reference fields I'm choosing. So I'm not fixing the redundancy by fixing, or uh, I'm not fixing the redundancy by simply expressing everything in terms of physical fields. There is still redundancy. I can still just choose either the blue or the red fields. And now yeah. applying this to the debate, um, I want to be very, very, um, sorry. Uh, oops, I just lost my slide. Yes. Um, I, I want to be very precise in what we're claiming. So all yeah. we're saying is that in this debate, one should not use the number of space-time points as an argument because that is not an invariant. I can just choose a different quantum reference frame and make it six points and I can make it two points. So any argument based on the number of points does not make sense to us. That is not to say that there are not other arguments in this debate that are very much worth mentioning and which I didn't have time to go into here. Um, it's just to say that space-time location is not a property of events that is invariant here and so should not be seen as an inherent property at least in the context of the quantum switch so that's precisely the claim that we're making but we are on the side of the dynamicist saying there are certain properties of the events making this an event and we do believe that it is um, Alice applying an operation and Alice applies the operation once and whether whether she does so in a superposition of time locations or a superposition of space-time locations or in a localized manner, that is only 
coordinate fluff in a, in a sense. Yeah, good. Okay, so you're saying on the on the one hand, debate's still open because this issue about number of events is um, not significant. And then I was going to ask you, well, then what do you really think? But then you answered that question. So yeah, you're yeah, on the right. side of the dirt. Yeah, so yeah, cool. yeah, the debate is still open, but it is settled for us. But that is, of course, <laughs> not how you settle a debate. Um, so, yeah, it's still ongoing. And I think there's still going to be interesting discussions uh, coming up on this in the future. But we hope to have brought some more insight into that. Like, yeah, I, we hope to have made more concrete some of the disagreements. Um, so that we can really see, do we believe in that one statement or in that other statement? Cool. Yeah, yeah. no, that's good. Thanks so much. Can you, I mean, can you really think of all the reference, like the QR one reference frame transformations is um, mapping between equivalent physical situations if it changes the subsystem structure? Like like thinking from the gauge and variant level, mm -hmm. mapping between different mm -hmm. um, sets of gauge and brain observables seems to be changing the physical description. The right. Theory. It changes the physical description, but not the physical situation. So as an example, uh, to be very concrete, uh, I can describe an experiment in the reference frame of my laboratory. So my reference fields are really given by the laboratory table and the clock and the door and some chair. And all we're saying is that there's nothing preventing us from describing this experiment or any other physical situation relative to the reference frame of some delocalized electron that you find in your laboratory. And ideally some electron field so that you have um, enough um, complexity to really identify things. But uh, let's say we're back in this quantum reference frame for quantum theory case, then all that would happen is that you would describe your entire experimental setup in some superposition um, of locations. So in a sense, everything around the electron is now superposed in the perspective of the electron. And nothing about the physical situation is changing. It's just that the description that you assign to it, it looks very, very different. And we, of course, prefer certain reference frames because the description we get relative to them seems much more reasonable because it's the description that 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 is valid in our reference frame and that we're used to seeing. Um, but uh, yeah, to have these observables in different quantum reference frames. So for instance, uh, I don't know, if we go into the language of like the Q hat operators, um, we could have Q3 minus Q1 and Q3, uh, Q2 three Q minus Q1. This would be in the reference frame of system one. And we could have um, Q1 minus Q2 and Q3, Q3 minus Q2, which would be in the reference frame of Q2. These are all different relative observable. So this is a different factorization, as you were saying. But of course, nothing changes about the, the configuration and the situation that you're describing. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And in particular, and I want to point this out here. It's just you're, it's just you're referring to in each of the reference frames when you trace out the pure, when you like fix all the gauge redundancies, what you're left with is different subsets of the same mm -hmm. configuration. Yes. Yeah. And then those different subsets, I mean, because they're different physical subsets, you could think of them as, well, different. Uh, I mean, the different subspaces would have different physical properties in general. Right, but they gauge variant properties. So I, I'm not disagreeing with you on uh, things looking different in different quantum reference frames, and maybe there being frames in which things make a lot more sense than in other frames, but it's also a nice tool to really disentangle what are gauge invariant properties, and they are the same in all quantum reference frames, and what are, gain, what are gauge variant ones. Um, and I think what you're alluding to are in the end gauge variant properties. Or a different, uh, or a different um, way of subdividing the gauge invariant ones. Um, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because there's still a certain redundancy in which sets of gauge invariant uh, properties you're dividing your Sure, into. yeah, yeah, there is a redundancy in which subset you. But the, but the fact that you can always keep mapping to other choices is what we take to As mean the that there is, no, yeah. there is no absolute physical significance in them. Yeah, 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 right. And um, uh, there was one comment you made earlier at the start on um, the invariance, QRF covariance in um, when a source mass is in superposition. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, I'm not being tested experimentally. Can you elaborate what you what you mean by it hasn't uh -huh. been tested experimentally? Yeah. Well, from a very naive point of view, we have never um, taken a detector and measured data in the laboratory reference frame and then changed right. into the detector in a quantum reference frame and checked whether that's coherent. Right. right. Um, as in, in um, the end, this a, idea so, of combining... So taking a, sorry, a source mass, seeing the detector response, and then doing the opposite where you put the source mass back and then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or put in other words, we have never, we are assuming linearity of quantum theory holding beyond what has been tested, plus the validity of, for instance, the theory of whatever theory of gravity we're using, whether it's Newtonian gravity or GR, and we're combining the two. And we're sort of assuming that these two assumptions together still give us meaningful and correct predictions. And we believe that this is true. This is the principle of yeah. um, variance under changes of quantum reference frame. But this itself is, is a symmetry principle that we're assuming, but which has not been tested in the same way as the classical one has been tested. We have performed experiments both in in the rest frame and in moving frames, and we found that physics looks the same. And this just has not been done yet. In right, the quantum. right. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, maybe I quickly uh, follow up. because uh, yeah, many of the things that I was also interested in were already raised. So maybe, uh, maybe I'll go back um, to these two versus four events because some other ideas that were floated around, uh, I guess more coming from quantum information crowd is mm -hmm. um, defining the number of events based on some resource. Essentially, um, you you try to incorporate in your in your scenario that each time there is an event, you pay. Like literally, yeah. there is some other yeah. system that mm -hmm. changes state. Um, but yeah, so I wonder if there is um, if if there is any way to relativize those. It it seems somehow by definition logically that this should give a fixed answer, but I would be curious actually to find some counter examples where you can you can think of some crazy scenario where even this wouldn't uh, yeah right um would somehow <laughs> depend on on the reference. Not sure. Um, so yeah, I, I was curious if you had any thoughts how one could. Mm -hmm. um, so we discuss some of these points in this in this essay right here. But what I maybe can say now is that what we're doing here for now is quantum reference frames for space time. So we're really applying diffeomorphisms and changing the space time location in one frame relative to that in the other frame. So if I were to put some additional counter system, which would raise by one um, or go from zero to one if Alice applied her operation, then this would also be a system also embedded in space-time or in a superposition of space-times. And just like the diffeomorphisms could change the location, either delocalize or localize Alice and her lab, then this counter would also be space-time delocalized or localized by these diffeomorphisms. So in the same sense, I can apply some weird quantum reference frame change in which then the counter is space-time delocalized and changes from zero to one upon the application of the operation. But this just happens in a space-time delocalized manner. So I think anything to do with properties of space-time location, we show with this that it's not relevant. Now, of course, uh, if you have some other quantum reference frame transformations, which apply other symmetry transformations, not just quantum diffeomorphisms, um, then I'm not sure what would happen. But here we see that, uh, and, and again, we discussed this more in this essay to understand which properties are, um, are relevant to look at or which are inherent properties, which properties can be changed or which properties cannot be accessed during um, the implementation of the experiment. Um, but yeah, so our discussion here really is only on space-time location of systems. And I believe that, yeah, if you add something like a resource counter, then this wouldn't change anything. I hope this addresses your questions a bit. All right, cool. Um, so 
if there are no more questions, um, yeah, thank you again for for coming and uh, giving yeah, really interesting.